Let's welcome in our co-host, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy. Good morning, Rob. The mantra for the day is set up straight. Don't slouch. Posture. <laughs> posture. You can avoid those trips to the chiropractor with better posture. And then joke, Maria. Or sitting in the highest <laughs> chair where you have to sit up straight. Well, just look at Maria's posture, though. <laughs> that is a good, healthy spine right there, Bill. There you go. There uh, you go. Bill's referencing on a Monday... He kept disappearing from the camera. <laughs> By the time uh, we were done with the show, he was down, I was like searching for him. All I could find was, was he in that other chair. Desk. He must no, have been no, in that. He was in this one. Just like taking a, in my case, French class years ago. <laughs> I did not want to be called upon, so I was trying to get lower and lower in my seat. <laughs> How did that work out for you? <laughs> Either the other day or in French class, <laughs> both of them. <laughs> Neither one worked. It was bad. We've covered that topic if you've taken French before, Bill. <laughs> yeah, that's and, right. Uh, it ended the same way. Yeah, yeah. and uh, for ones that have not heard it, I was working on my doctorate. I had to have a foreign language. I'm not very good with English, much less foreign <laughs> language. And so I was contracting with a, a, uh, someone to help me teach French or pronounce French. And after a couple of so weeks of this, she came up to me and said, Mr. Stubblefield, we're wasting your money. We're wasting my time. <laughs> so you'll never make it. And there's truth to that. Hey, you know you tried. I'm, there, not very hard. There's, but. Uh, there's there's points for effort too. Our guest in this segment uh, speaks another language as well. General uh, Mookie Walker is with us uh, this morning. General, good morning to you. Buongiorno. You walked in. You gave me a, a, a full Italian greeting. About a minute of conversation, and uh, I even I even knew, I think I knew about eighty percent of it too. It's been about uh, forty years. Since I've, the I've been Italian grandma, when been, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. when, when that's been conversed, but that was uh, pretty good. Where do you, obviously you spent time in Italy. I spent time in Italy. I've, I've, I've spent time in. Look, it, it's easier for me to tell you which countries I did not spend time in, rather than tell you the ones that I did spend time in. So the important part is you did spend time in Italy. Oh yes, oh yes, and I loved it, and yeah. uh, and I was in Vicenza. And in Vicenza, it's it's necessary to speak English if you're going to meet the ladies. And I was a young <laughs> captain, and I, and so I I forced myself to learn. Smart. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How much time did you spend there? Uh, three months, and I was helping with the operation Provide Promise. I was at their what they call their Combined Air Operations Center, and we were planning all the airdrops of food to the S- Serbs. Uh, and any any of the folks out there who were being hunted down and impressed, and so we were doing food drops. So what time frame was this then, General? What this was 1993, so gotcha. 30 years ago. The yes. Slobodan Milosevic <laughs> era there, right, I guess, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, talk about your decision to run for higher office. Ooh, okay, so I'm uh, uh, due to much prayer and also a lot of goading, from veterans and uh, and Air National Guard and Army National Guard folks, and even folks at the Pentagon, they're saying, "Man, we got to send you up there." And I said, "Send me up there? What does that mean? Like, we got to send you to Congress?" I said, Ooh, "Okay, all right." And then after praying about it, I decided, you know what? With all that's going on in the world right now, uh, it's, it's, uh, and what's important to me is the border and our national security, and and with the national security. I marvel in the bad way at what I see happening with uh, DOD officials, what they're doing with uh, purchasing the proper munitions, the proper number of munitions. We say in our national defense strategy that China is supposed to be our pacing challenge, and yet they they only buy enough munitions for maybe two salvos and uh, with all the let's say we had we had all of our submarines operating during a dust up with china they uh, the, the mark 48 torpedoes they'd have enough for one and a half shots i said that's crazy what, why aren't we buying those so, uh, same thing with uh, the munitions the, the sea viper missiles that they're using the two million dollar missiles that they're using to shoot down the two thousand dollar Drones there with the Houthis, well, those are the same sort of missiles that they will use to to counter China's uh, ballistic anti ship missiles and uh, and and anti ship cruise missiles. China has a lot of those missiles. We don't have a lot of those munitions. And then, thirdly, even even then, let's say they expend all of their their missiles, we do not have 
uh, the ability to reload at sea right now. So they, all of those ships have to turn back and go to a safe port, uh, a safe certified port to get those missiles uh, reloaded. And there are not a lot of ports that are out of range of China's missiles. So it puts us in a dilemma. We should be planning for this in a more serious and mature way. Yeah, you're making a very good point, but at least we have the awareness today. Uh, going back several years prior to the Second World War, uh, for much of the 30s, we ignored the awareness. And we, our stockpiles of both ammunition and personnel got very, very, very low. Fortunately, in 38 to 39, a, a, some awareness started creeping in. So when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, we were in somewhat of a better position than it would have been two, even two years earlier than that. And, uh, and I salute uh, the preparedness that yeah. they had back yeah. in World War yeah. II. We should be having the same yeah. level of yeah. seriousness now. Matter of fact, uh, artillery, 155 millimeter artillery shells. Uh, we have doubled in the last year our ability uh, to produce them. And so now we can produce 28,000 per month. Do you know how many of those shells Ukraine uses per month? 110,000. So we're not even making enough for them, much less ourselves. So again, we need to get serious about this. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Ukraine. Uh, we're at a tipping point now. Will we support or will we not support? Uh, it's uh, the national debate. and It seems to be broken down by party lines. It is too. broken down by party lines. Yeah. There's there's an analogy, kind of a weak analogy, uh, coming out of Vietnam. Uh, the neighboring company, Cambodia, uh, we literally turned our back on Cambodia. Uh, became one of the largest countries of genocide, genocide of anywhere Clear in the rules, world. Yes. And we, I think there's some risk of doing the same thing in Ukraine. And, uh, so I'd like to say this. I do not think that, okay, there are Republicans who don't want uh, Ukraine money in the bill, and, but I, I have a feeling I know why. Well, we, first of all, we need to be using that money for us to secure the southern border and also buy our own munitions. But you all may or may not know that uh, there's $300 billion, with a B, of Russian money that w we have frozen. And part of it is in the United States, part of it is in Europe. It's going to take a little while to convince the Europeans, but we should be using that money to, to, to send to Ukraine and use Russian money to beat Russia. Meanwhile, we have our, ourselves to look after right now, and I don't think we're looking after ourselves well enough. But can we not do both? Because the Ukraine is, is, and our involvement is limited to supply. We're not to do anything else other than just supplying. And uh, whereas the southern border, we do need a lot of attention there. But I, I think we're capable of doing both. Well, I'll say this. Uh, again, I'm of the belief that America, the United States, should not be the sole helper. We have a lot of countries in NATO who could, should be chipping in. But they are. They are. If you look at a, a gross national product, mm -hmm. uh, the European countries are contributing more, much more than what we are. Well, combined, okay. But again, they can be... Uh, they could be providing more. Matter of fact, uh, Germany, which is the biggest industrial powerhouse in Western Europe, still isn't uh, bringing their spending up to the 2% of GDP that they promised for NATO. So again, they could be doing more. Instead of us doing more, get them to do more, and then we, and then we can come to a compromise. Well... Yes, but I, I think if you look at Germany, for example, and also mm -hmm. the Netherlands and the like, they they're contributing to the uh, to the NATO involvement two different ways. They're doing it as individual countries. Countries. Mm -hmm. They're also doing uh, doing it through the EU. Uh, so they're actually double contribution. Some of these of these of these countries. Well, when we look at the the numbers of what they've promised to do mm -hmm. for NATO, they're not doing it. And and just got to call them on that. It's 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 like somebody you're going out to dinner with every week, uh, and when the check comes, they go, hey, "My wallet's a little light. Can you help me out?" And they, but they've doing been doing that for years and years, and we have not uh, called them on the carpet.
Bill, I don't want to say anything while Gilstrap's not here to defend himself, so no jokes over there on your end. Right. Just kidding, John. So, Maria, changing ahead. gears a little bit, General, yes. what possessed... I didn't mean to make it sound like that. What possessed you? What prompted you? Um, obviously, you don't... You're, you're disenchanted with what's happening in our country now, but this is your first foray into into the political realm, correct? Correct. Okay. So not city council, not county commission, not house of delegates. You went straight for the, um, just because of an opportunity well, or... Um, that's, uh, so uh, being in command of thousands of, of people uh, puts you in that sort of political stead because you have to make certain decisions that are going to be uh, good for the entire unit and then certain decisions that will be good for that particular troop, whether it's an airman, soldier, sailor, or marine. And, and then, matter of fact, uh, back in 2019, I was sort of mayor uh, for a little while when they had the World Scout Jamboree. Uh, so for that period of time, I was the Joint Task Force Commander under North, Northern Command, NORTHCOM, to uh, to oversee the security, logistics, and medical for all of those scouts from around the world. Uh, we're supposed to only say it's 150 plus countries that came, but it, the true count was 171. Some of those countries didn't want it to be known that they are there with with, with Israel. So so we had to be political in that. And, and these are the sort of things uh, that I have to deal with. And uh, so I, I I think I have enough experience. First of all with uh, administration, uh, have enough experience with compromise in, in the Pentagon, holy smokes. Uh, you'd think that a good idea would would sail through, but sometimes it takes months to, to get the final approval. And it's the same thing with, with Congress. Sometimes uh, to get a bill across, it's, it takes a lot of grind, a lot of compromise, and a lot of debate. And I've been doing that for many, many years. General Mookie Walker, our guest here on the program, candidate for Congress. And uh, it's a big district because there's only two of you for the whole state of West Virginia. Now. Oh, how, yes. how much of your district have you seen so far in person? All right. Parkersburg, Clarksburg, Weston, uh, Buchanan, uh, Wheeling, Morgantown, uh, Martinsburg, of course, uh, uh, Berkeley Springs. Uh, so you've traveled. Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm wearing out my tires. I'm wearing out the soles of my shoes. I, I'm telling you. I, I know I, I'm a West Virginian by choice, but I know West Virginians, and West Virginians aren't going to trust you by just a newspaper article. Mm -hmm. i got to go and meet them, and they have to see my personality. They have to talk to me and look at, look at me in my eyes. Then I get their trust. What are they telling you? What are you hearing overwhelmingly from the people you've spoken with? Well, they're they're worried about the the border, and and they're worried about the border for not only the the illegal immigrants coming across, but they're worried about the drugs, the fentanyl coming over, and and how you know, West Virginia is is severely uh, affected by the by the drug scourge, as I call it, and uh, so that's something that they want me to to do something about, not only stop the the folks coming in through the border but stop the drugs coming in and and secure that and uh, then also i'm hearing from some people uh i need to support the recovery centers as well because mm -hmm. it's it's a two-pronged thing uh, uh about four years ago i was the the lead for the west virginians drug demand reduction uh program and we know that it takes two things, stopping the, the flow, inflow of the drugs, and it also takes helping the addicts to not be addicts anymore. Uh, if, if you do one or the other, you're going to lose. You've got to do them both. And so that, that was the basis of our program. Are you familiar with what Berkeley County has done as far as rehabilitation from drug problems? I don't know what the county itself yeah. has done. I know that there are a couple of uh, uh, recovery centers. There. Yeah, and the the county has been very, uh, I think, very aggressive in taking this problem on, mm -hmm. in large part because one of our county commissioner's son died due to drug involvement a few years ago, and he took it as a personal mandate on his part to try to 
aggressively pursue pursue treatment for drug addicts and and i i think our county and you when you're up in one of these trips you might want to look in more detail yes. i think there's a lot to be learned what the county has done yeah, if that can be replicated then yeah we, we can save west virginia yeah. yeah uh now i'm going to go to labeling and i realize labels are always uh wrong uh or subject to uh, some misinterpretation but right now the republicans tend to describe themselves or are being described as either a what we call a chamber of commerce republican or a social warrior republican would you put yourself in either one of those two categories actually i'd put myself between those i I'm, I'm i'm very concerned about uplifting business small business and even large business and bringing it to west virginia because that way we can stem the outflow of west virginians to other states and then the social warrior part well yes I, I i am very concerned that the indoctrination happening in some of our schools and uh, uh some of the schools are don't even do the pledge of allegiance anymore and they and some of the teachers are actually teaching the kids to hate America, and I go, holy smokes, no wonder we have a recruitment problem, because you, know, you cannot get people to recruit, uh, recruited to fight for our country if they don't love our country. I don't know the source of this. One of our listeners, Chris, uh, just wrote in our uh, comment section in regards to the comment about illegal drugs on the border. General, 90% of fentanyl is coming through the legal points of entry. Just 0.09% have been migrants carrying over the border. I don't know how we, well, I don't know what, again, the source of that information is. Most of the fentanyl is coming in shipping containers and through the mail. This narrative continues to be misrepresented by multiple guests on this show in the last few months. So there are several people who are saying the same thing, but uh, one of our viewers, Chris, says uh, that's bad information. Where, where do you get your information on that as a source, General? I get my information from FBI. I get my information from Border Patrol. Matter of fact, I, two Tuesdays ago, uh, one, two, no, three Tuesdays ago, I was actually down in Yuma uh, getting a tour of the border from the mayor of Yuma and a couple of Border Patrol agents. And they're, they're, they're telling me that, that human trafficking and drugs uh, are coming in uh, extensively. Now, what capacity were you in uh, when you were in Yuma? Were you part of a delegation, individual? How did you, how did you get a tour? Individual. Individual. Okay. Yep. And uh, I had some friends set up the tour for me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see for myself. So... 60 Minutes the last uh, month has done two features on the border. And one thing both features have in common is that people find ways to get to the border. They find ways through the border. And inevitably, they pass Border Patrol agents as they're going under, through, or over a barrier who are unable to stop them. And at that point, they just continue along the path until they get to processing. That to the average person, that wouldn't seem right. If if I climb over Bill's wall into his house and he's standing there looking at me while I'm doing it, it would seem like he has the right to stop me. Why don't we have the same right at the border? It's 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 even more strange than you said. Uh, the border patrol agents who who were taking me around, they said, hey, they they once they get across the wall, they'll just stand there and wait for us to come to them, and then they have a script ready to to, to tell the border patrol people so that they they can actually get processed as uh, asylum seekers. Yeah. Uh, General, we have a listening, a contributing audience through Facebook that take no prisoners. Mm -hmm. If we do so, if we say something wrong or if someone uh, uh, says something they they question, they challenge us, which oh, I uh, think is very, very oh, good. Oh, yes, yes. One of our folks uh, wrote in just a second ago, where are these teachers that are teaching students to hate America. Can you all throughout them all throughout? Uh, uh, so you, uh, we can see news stories all the time of, of, and we see some of these teachers actually bragging about it. And I've seen plenty of them. And if if this listener would just search for that, you'll 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 find plenty of teachers who who are coming out on TikTok bragging about what they're doing. Maybe so. I've not encountered that, uh, but again, I do not follow TikTok, so I'm not going to challenge you, but I, I personally have not seen that. So. so in West Virginia, you haven't necessarily personally experienced teachers teaching it, hate to uh, students. It, thank, thankfully, in West Virginia, uh, it, that problem is not as rife as it is in New York and California and Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
that doesn't say it doesn't exist. And so we have to have uh, certain policies to ensure that our, our children are not being indoctrinated. No, that's, uh, Go ahead. Okay, that leads me to another thing. Are we in West Virginia becoming more big government? I don't see that, actually. Uh, I, I, see, I see West Virginians are are proud and strong and they and they want to take care of themselves uh, uh, that has actually been the main feeling I get when I'm talking to West Virginians mm -hmm. and I've seen it for years even the folks in the guard many of the folks in the National Guard are not full-time they have their own jobs other and, and then they to put on the uniform when called mm -hmm. and uh, and they they are hard workers and they build their own businesses they work as as police officers uh, they work, some work as doctors some as lawyers uh, they, they are they are hard-working West Virginians yeah, I, I don't question that at all. I think you're exactly right there. Uh, but some of the legislation that has been passed or at least proposed mm. can be interpreted as moving us more and more toward big government, more and more invasive in our our private rights, if you will. I'm going to just jump in real quick again. The general's running for Congress, not House of Delegates or State Senate, you're, you're so I don't right, want to, I don't right. want to conflate yeah, the two. I, I'm yeah. sorry. You're exactly right, yeah. Rob. Sorry. So, but it was an interesting question. Yeah, I'll give you a push for that, Admiral. I'll, I'll definitely give you that. Hey, I want to talk about deficit spending and the, and the, and the, uh, the nation's national debt. Uh, we are, if you listen to most people who address this topic, to borrow the phrase from Bill, tipping point, with how much we are going to spend annually on interest to service this debt, which doesn't we'll seem to be never ever back. pay it off. Right it, 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 at this point, it is impossible. And, and and funny enough, we've been able to balance our budget before. Nineteen uh, nineties uh, 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 with Newt Gingrich as the Speaker of the House, he actually. Uh, Worked it and convinced Bill Clinton to sign it, and they did it. And so it can be done. And but nowadays, uh, I think, uh, you know, sorry if I offend any Democrats, but the but the Democrats are are trying to buy votes with the 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 people not having to pay back their student loans uh, and giving out all sorts of freebies so that they can get some votes. But that's not helping our country. Yeah. That, that that is that is making our national debt worse. Well, it, but, but both presidents, uh, both presidential parties have run up major deficits. The Trump uh, administration ran up major deficits before that. Obama, Bush, they're all contributing to it, General, yes. with all due respect. And I don't see a way out under the way we are currently operating things we're fighting Two foreign wars, although we pulled back out of Ukraine a little bit. The Israeli-Palestine situation isn't calming down. We've got massive obligations in Social Security, Medicare, and we have to fund the military because yes. of the threats all around the world, which seem to be joining forces against us right now when oh, you look yes. at the axis of evil that's out there. How do we control spending in those environments so we'll raise enough revenue? Well, first of all, those of us in Congress have got to come together and say, "All right, we're gonna we're gonna push for a balanced budget." Now, a lot of uh, Social Security, Medicare, all of that we can't touch, but but some of the other uh, freebies and bennies that they're giving out, uh, some of those will have to be cut. You you see what the new president of, of Argentina did? Holy smokes, he, he he turned things around in a matter of weeks and got their uh, got their uh, budget balanced. But he made hard choices, and so there are going to be certain government agencies here that will have to trim down. You know, I, no one likes to hear it, but, but we've we've gone over bloated uh, with 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 all of the the government agencies we have. But yeah, uh, but if I if memory serves, only about seventeen percent is really discretionary funding. The rest is hard funding, the military, social security, the third rail of politics. Uh, the seventeen percent allow can you adjust within the seventeen percent enough to make any difference? Well uh that seventeen percent is still seventeen percent. It is right. Yeah. And, and if, so, if somebody said, "I'm going to give you seventeen percent off of uh, uh, this new car," you'd say, I "I'll take it." Uh, so every little bit helps, but we have to have discipline. We also have to, with what we're spending on the military, we have to spend that wisely uh, as well. Uh, so, uh, 
Some may say, and and I can agree with them, that some of that that spending is wasted and going toward folly programs or 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 even just uh, helping out the bros helping bros. The uh, golden toilet, uh, yeah, toilet yeah, seat, yeah. for example. Yeah. But, so we have to be a lot smarter about that. And if we send more veterans to Congress, especially with the veterans with my experience, we'll be able to hold the DOD's feet to the fire. But the same thing with the DOJ, the same thing with the Department of Energy. Uh, we need people there. Uh, look, Congress holds the purse strings, right? So we should be having oversight on all of this and then hold their feet to the fire. General Walker, final minute is yours. Anything you'd like to say to our audience? Now's your chance. All right. Well, audience, uh, I want you all to know that I would appreciate your support. Go to www.chriswalkerforcongress.com. And the four is actually F-O-R, not the number four. Chriswalkerforcongress.com. And uh, I want you to get out there and vote uh, because primary day is is the most important. If you wait till November, then you, you might get somebody who you don't want up in Congress. And if it's a Republican, that's the slam dunk winner. So the winner really is the winner of the primary. That's correct. All right. General Walker, great to see you. Great to see you again. Thank you for coming in. Ciao.